If you have done a COVID-19 test at home by yourself for one reason or another, maybe you have to travel or something else, or if you are planning to do a test by yourself, you're probably thinking about this question. How good are these tests, right? Can you rely on them? What's the accuracy? And believe it or not, many people who watch my videos regularly on my channel, they reach out to me all the time because they're confused about the results they are getting from these so-called rapid antigen tests. So you are not alone if you are confused about it and if you are wondering about what the accuracy is. Hello everyone, if you are new to my channel, I am Naveen Agarwal and I make these types of videos just to share my understanding of these questions. And uh, I have a lot of technical background and I review a lot of medical papers FDA guidance, CDC guidance, I look at all the technical information out there and I try to analyze it to present to you in a way which is simple and easy to understand. So I'm trying to do this as part of this video series. If you have any questions or comments, just let me know as uh, part of the discussion in this video or uh, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn and have a discussion there. So in this video, I will actually discuss with you the accuracy of one of the COVID-19 rapid antigen tests because it happens to be one of the more popular ones. You might have heard about this. It's called Binex now and I'm not picking on them. I'm going to start with Binex now and in other videos, I will talk about other tests because I have no relationship with these companies and I'm doing it just as an independent review just to share my understanding with you and help you understand what those results might mean. So I will focus on Binex now. I'll help you understand what actually me mean by accuracy. And when it comes to these tests, there are two things. Accuracy has two parts. When the test is positive, it should really be quite accurately telling us that we are actually positive. And if the test is negative, then we should have a high level of confidence in that result that we are actually negative. And that's what accuracy would mean in a very simple plain terms. So there are two parts to accuracy about these tests. When it's positive, it should be very accurate. When it's negative, it should be very accurate. So I will share with you how they actually demonstrate the level of accuracy and what it might mean for you. So we'll look into that. So this is the Binex Now test. And again, as I said, I have no relationship with the company. I'm not picking on them. And this is just a starting point. I will be discussing more of these tests in future videos. So the table below in this slide actually comes from the paperwork they have filed with the FDA as part of their uh, approval process. And it has two parts. So I'll go very slowly. On the top right, you have the comparator method, which usually is a RT-PCR test. And they are evaluating the performance of their test, which is called the Binex Now COVID-19 AG card, within seven days of symptom onset against this comparator or RT-PCR method. So they want to see how many times they get a positive result from their test and how does it compare with a positive result from the comparator method. So in this case, 99 out of the 117 total positive cases were found to be positive by this test. And they calculate a number, 84.6% at the bottom of the table. That is what they call the positive agreement. One side of the story. The other side of the story is on the negative results, right? We talked about that. So in this case, they are finding that 338 results were negative out of a total of 343 confirmed negative results from this comparator method. So they calculate a negative agreement of 98.5%. So on the surface of it, you might think that, okay, positive agreement is 84, 80, let's say 85%. So that's the accuracy and that's what I can expect. A negative agreement is about 99%. So negative agreement seems to be a little bit better. Now, keep in mind that this is done in the lab setting as part of what they call clinical validation. In the real world, things look a little bit different and we're going to look into that. Okay, so how do you understand the test performance at an individual level? Keep in mind that 85% positive agreement we saw on the previous slide does not mean there is an 85% chance you are positive for COVID-19 when the test result is positive for you. This is the most confusing thing for people that the data shows 85% agreement. So if I'm positive, there's 85% chance I'm positive. Actually, that is not the case. And let's work through, now be patient with me. 
going to be a little bit of a math, but it's going to try to make it very simple for you. Okay, so we can do like a, you know, comparison. You can have from the comparator method confirmed COVID-19 cases and confirmed non-COVID-19 cases. And from our antigen test, we could have positive or negative result. So on the top left, whatever we get is true positive, right? 99 of them in this case were true positive. 18 were false negatives. That means they were supposed to be positive, but our test, this test measured them to be negative. And they find this diagnostic sensitivity, which is the same as positive agreement of 84.6%. That's how they get the number. Okay. On the other side, 338 are truly negative because they measure negative when the comparator method is telling us they are negative. But five are false positive. So that gives us a diagnostic specificity or negative agreement of 98.5%. This does not mean at an individual level, you will have this level of accuracy. And there's a lot of math behind it. Uh, there's a you have to look around the rate of prevalence. How prevalent is the disease in your area? And let's use the number for assumption, 5%. Let's say the rate of prevalence is 5% in your area where you live. There's a concept in mathematics called positive predictive value. We can use this number to actually predict how confident we will be in your positive result. And if you do the math, you will come out with 75% only. In your area, if the disease prevalence is 5% and you measure positive, only a 75% chance that it's a real positive. And look at the range, 56 to 88%. So it's a very big range. And that is happening because the way they have performed this validation, you know, they still have looked at only few samples, few hundred samples, not a thousands of samples or millions of samples. So there is a little, little bit of uncertainty in these numbers. So 86%, 85% is not the same as this 75%. On the negative side, the numbers look much better, much higher level of confidence, 99%. So if the test comes negative, you can be very confident that you are negative. But if it comes positive, your level of confidence is going to be low. What does this all mean? That's why many people are sharing with me their frustration that they have no symptoms, they got a positive result, and then they went to do a RT-PCR test that gave them a negative result. It was a false positive result. And by the way, this is not the problem with just this test. This is a problem with all of the rapid antigen tests. So again, I'm not picking on this, but I'm helping you understand what it means and why you might see a false positive. And these reports are flowing into the FDA. FDA requires as a condition of approval or authorization that the company will report when they hear news about false positives or false negatives. And that data is out there. So I looked at the data for you. Uh, since last year and up until now, this is called adverse events reported to the FDA. There's a database called MON. And in my business, which is medical devices, people know this. And there are certain limitations and I will discuss that with you. But here's the data. Since uh, last year and up until now, close to 300 false positive results have been reported you know, about a hundred false negative and other problems like they're not valid or non-reproducible. But the point I'm trying to make is that it is not uncommon for a test like this to give you false positive results. And again, we cannot make too much out of this. So don't read too much into this information. Uh, it is just a number and there are many limitations. But the point I'm trying to make here is FDA is hearing about this and they are keeping an eye on it. And in fact, they have taken actions against many different tests where performance is much worse than what they expected. And they have taken them off the market. This test is not that bad, okay? It's actually a good test and these numbers are not uncommon. Okay, so let me repeat that. These numbers are not uncommon. I'm sharing these numbers with you to make you aware that if you find yourself in a situation that you're getting a false positive result, you are not alone. It's expected and it can happen. So what can you do in those scenarios, right? Let's talk about that. So let's take a scenario. You have no symptoms, comes out positive. You're pretty sure it's a false positive. What should you do? You have two options. You could do an RT-PCR test or you could repeat the same test maybe two or three days later. In fact, FDA has advised many people to do a repeat test. But whatever you decide to do, talk to your doctor and find the right approach. 
whatever works for you. But do not get get upset or do not get nervous or in a panic that you have COVID. There's a very big chance it might be a false positive. Okay, so you you must you must confirm that. Now, if you are negative, you have a very high level of confidence. Ninety nine percent is a true negative. That you can be very confident. Although there are some false negatives being reported, but they are much much lower in number as you saw. So you can be very confident. It doesn't mean that you throw caution to the wind. You still still should exercise caution when you go out, especially if you are not vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, you have a pretty high level of protection even now for even the Delta variant. But if you're not vaccinated, this could be a high risk for you. So you continue to exercise caution, even if you're negative. And if you have to travel somewhere or you're required to do testing, you will probably have to repeat this test anyway. I hope this makes sense. I know, I really know and understand, understand the frustration that it can be confusing because I've heard this from many, many people. And that's why I do videos like these to help you understand at a deeper level to make sure you make the right decision as a follow up to uh, what you should do. Let me know your questions and comments. And I hope all of you continue to stay safe in these difficult circumstances. And I look forward to hearing from you.